I'm a bit nervous. I feel like a bit like a celebrity. It was my first experience of Startup Lab, you know, a little studio in Kennington, sitting around a whiteboard going, okay, how the hell do we market this thing to exactly. people? What do people want? I've been to like a really academic uni and I'd chosen to do lots of like artistic things. So like I spent loads of time singing. And one of the things it really did teach me is about failure, about risk, about also self-belief. When things are going bad, the ability to say, okay, it's going to be fine. In order to be successful, you have to acknowledge. It's about living on that little yeah. bleeding edge but that's where you find real success. Yeah. I have an anxious personality and I had a panic attack really? about like how big a step that was. Your three bits of advice for co-founders in this market right now. First thing that I always lean on. Lawrence Booth Cliven. Welcome Hi. to Nevermind the Job Spec, the podcast. Thank, thank you, for, you having me. for joining me. Yeah, this well, is... thank you for having me, man. This is my this is my first podcast. You're joking, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm a bit nervous. It's oh, a bit what? like uh I feel like a bit like a celebrity, like I've got stuff to well, say. You, you but are, I well, I mean, you know, you are on the kind of Forbes 30 under 30 <laughs> list, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is perfect timing, right? Yeah, perfect timing for my my great uh, emergence into <laughs> exactly. the world. You know? in your emergence into social media. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's time for my personal brand. Exactly, to, yeah. It's yeah. kind of dragging you yeah. out reluctantly. I kind of feel like, like I want to go back in. You know, it's quite <laughs> scary, you know? <laughs> Keep on looking at the post button on LinkedIn and be like, eh, no. I can't do it. Oh, buddy. Listen, this I'm I was super looking forward to this conversation. As soon as you agreed to to kind of come on the podcast, I was like, this could be great fun. Um, <laughs> and it, it, every conversation we've had since we've met, I always find super amusing. Mm. We always find out something more. Um mm. music. But we'll, we'll we'll get into all of that. But what I wanted to do, because you've had such a an interesting and probably quite accelerated journey to where you are now. I was curious to take you back to kind of 2016 when you you kind of graduated from your master's. Yeah. And I was curious to know what you thought the world of work would offer you at that point. What were you looking for? What were you what, what was your expectation? Uh, that's a difficult question, you know. I feel like I I just looking back on myself when I was that age, I had absolutely no idea. Yeah about what real life looked like. I think uh, I've been to like a really academic uni and I'd chosen to do lots of like artistic things. So like I spent loads of time singing. I remember like, and I remember, yeah. So I spent loads of time singing. I spent loads of time doing like art stuff. I loved it and I loved my subject. I loved what I did. I spent ages in the library writing and all of these people around me were doing like internships and were like thinking about their jobs and they wanted to be lawyers and bankers and consultants. And I was like, Fuck, I should, uh, <laughs> oh, am I allowed to swear? Yeah, of course you are. I, 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 yeah, I was going to ask you that before. <laughs> God, I have. Um, but I, 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 I was like, okay, I really should try and do that. Yeah. And, um, so I, I thought that's what kind of all work was. And I, and I just really bombed it. Like I did one thing for like a law firm. I did like an internship. And when it came to the job interview, they literally were like, you don't want to be a lawyer, do you? And I was like in that room being like, probably not. <laughs> it's a good question, actually. Like, yeah. like I, I just feel like it's probably what I should do. Um, and I think my expectations were just like, like all over the place. Like I either yeah. thought I would get like a corporate job or there's this like other yeah. thing. And so I um, thought about being a singer for a while. So I did loads of music at uni. I still yeah. sing now. Um, and I thought that was going to be. And then... Um, quite quickly, I realized that I wanted something like a different style of challenge. I wanted like an intellectual challenge and a kind of a, a different style of challenge. And then when I got my first job, it was like a totally different experience, like yeah. numbers and uh, like working with our people and teams and meetings, mm -hmm. agendas, like all of that <laughs> stuff that you, just, you don't really get when you're on your own in a library yeah. writing about... Um, 20th century British painting, you know, like it's quite far <laughs> away from the world of digital marketing, exactly. P&Ls and Excel, yeah, you know. A little so. bit removed. I think the interesting thing I noticed in your kind of early career history is, yeah. to your point, you like to try stuff. So a number of internships in different kind of completely mm. different sectors, which, you know, a couple of months here, two, three months, just to try mm. and understand a, a, a different environment, which I thought kind of plays into a, what I know of you. You're, you you'd like you're curious you like to explore you're not you you don't sort of see like an end point and think okay that is it you're always like 
And what's beyond that? Yeah, it's a very kind way of saying I've got a very short attention span. <laughs> I like, uh, no, I think I think a curiosity is a big part of. Yeah. I like I love exploring. Yeah. I love new ideas. I yeah. love uh, consuming information. Basically, I think that's the thing that I probably feel like I'm good at is yeah. reading about stuff and exploring stuff and trying to get to a point where I have an opinion on it. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I think my early early career probably still now, like I feel like I'm always exploring. And I think it's one of the things I really like about what I do now yeah. is that I'm jumping between loads of different things, you know, like having five different companies under one roof. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you constantly are picking up different styles of problem yeah. and learning about different customers and different audiences and different business models. Yeah. And it kind of, I think that variety kind of gets me going. Yeah, um, definitely. Because you've got that kind of constant itch to find yeah. new stuff out. Yeah, um, we we will explore that a bit more, but I, I do want to bring you back to the singing. Yes, simply because I, I'm I, not going to sing now. I can't. I'm not. I don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't well, I mean, if you pay me, I might. Yeah, sing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it it's something that I obviously discovered when we first met, and I was like, okay, cool. That that sounds quite interesting, and I explored it prior to the podcast, mm. and. I landed on a YouTube video mm. of you back in 2013. Yeah. So European Union, Union Baroque Orchestra Handel yeah. for um, an ode to the birthday of Queen Anne. Right? Yes. Good and piece. and it, it, I think the thing that struck me was <clears throat> it was really beautiful to listen to. Yeah. I mean, genuinely, just kind of immediately just invokes this kind of calm but interest. That's interesting. And I could... But you're I, not a classical music guy. No, not at so all. So what, what, what about it what did it, you find? I, genuinely, I love music. Okay. So I love discovering new yeah. music. I love, yeah. I'm open to listening to new music. Yeah. And I think it was just, it was the story okay. that the music told, yeah. which kind of really drew me in. And mm. as I was kind of watching the camera pan around and catch you yeah. kind of singing, I was just thinking to myself, man, how amazing must it have been to be part of that, in that environment, in that moment, with the, the the kind of synchronizing of all these voices and music mm -hmm. and that, the, I mean, what did it feel like? It's a great question. Uh, what it does feels, it feel like to sing? It feels, it, it feels like nothing. I I can't really describe it to be yeah. honest. Like it's the experience of making music is uh, for me like uh, really like my happy place. Yeah. Um, there's something about being with other people, the collective breath, the collective um, sort of uh, like teamwork without necessarily talking, like everyone singing off the same hymn sheet, literally. Yeah. Um, but you have to work together in a group. Um, and that, uh, but that collective kind of euphoria when it goes well is just, it's, it's extraordinary. And it's, it's, a, it's not just an adrenaline rush, it is an adrenaline rush, but it's also, it just sits with you, it lasts with you. Yeah. I think that 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 tour in particular was really interesting because that was when I it was my first year in so this the choir I sang with at uni was quite kind of I guess quite serious we we toured a lot we did lots of different recording projects um they're an amazing choir go check them out yeah. choir of Clare College Cambridge Graham Ross director um it's a great they're a great group yeah. um who do really interesting projects and that that particular project uh, was with a guest conductor Lars Ulrich Mortensen who is incredible and like the thing I remember most about it was like it was fun yeah. it was like it was like you're singing this thing and everyone's like oh we got it we got it yeah, yeah. um Ah, it's awesome. It's a um, kind of moment because obviously, I mean, you don't just rock up and perform, right? There, no. there is, you know, consistent practice prior yeah. to that. On that kind of run up to the to the actual show, yeah. Are, are there are there moments in those kind of practices where you're just you're just like, yes, yes, with this, if we take this to the final performance, it's just going to be exhilarating. I think so. I think. I think there's nothing that can beat live performance. Yeah, I was going to say. There's nothing that can beat being in front of people. I think, I mean, about that recording, obviously there's like cameras, like we were on TV yep. and it was like being recorded and it was on live radio and that, adre like that adrenaline of like, yeah. you can't screw up. Like it's, yeah. it's like, there's that edge. You know, always to have that high, you need that bit of risk. Yeah. Whereas in rehearsal, there's never that. But in rehearsal, sometimes something happens yeah. and you're like, really, it just, you're like, you're singing really well. Like the thing about singing, right, is it's 
it's bodily, like it's yeah. your breath, it's your diaphragm, it's your entire body that needs to be aligned in order to make the right noise. Especially, uh, and, and I, I guess like, especially with the kind of singing, like the classical singing style, there's, there's particular technique that's really about relaxation. Like people talk about it as like controlled relaxation. Yeah. Um, and when you really hit, and you're in, and you're in that moment, you're like, I'm singing really well. Yeah. That is like great. Ironically, on that recording, I didn't think I was singing very well. I actually made I make a I made a mistake during that during yeah. that thing. But um it it it's it's a really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So two things, well, there's three things in that which I find really interesting. One, how did you recover from the mistake? What was did it I mean, it's kind of one of those things where do you acknowledge it, just move on, right? It's kind of almost like a a, a bookmark, right? I, I acknowledge that, yeah. but it's about the, the the full performance as opposed yeah. to that one thing. Or does it linger slightly? I want to say that I was at this kind of peak of of kind of zen yeah, ability yeah. to deal with it, yeah. and um, I kind of acknowledged it and moved on. And you kind of have to, right? The yeah. music is moving, and every and and I think actually one of the beauties of live performance is mistakes happen, yeah. you know, and and that's kind of nice. You know, you don't want Human, it to. There's it? something about music making where you don't it sometimes people want to try and create the perfect thing yeah. and that has its own beauty and that's amazing but actually sometimes the imperfect thing is just as beautiful yeah um and especially live performance the imperfect is yeah. is wonderful but yeah that that recording actually i get there's a there's a bit in later in the video that mm. you won't have seen but i get i get mocked for quite a lot quite heavily in my singing friendship group where i make the mistake and then i shake my head like that a lot and, so and, I, and I physically cannot like I don't know I'm 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 a classic insecure overachiever right so so like I've made a mistake I failed and like my my entire world falls apart for about three seconds yeah and then you kind of get back on the horse yeah. but but in that moment yeah I'm quite I quite I quite <laughs> I've never been very good at hiding my emotions anyway so yeah. um I was but I was well, probably, I was probably what 18 19 yeah. so I think that's interesting though the can we say that 99% of that performance was you at your optimum? Mm. But I mean, even 99.5 yeah. and then the 0.05 stays with you. Yeah. is the bit that stays with yeah. you. And it's kind of like, is there some, and we might be, yeah, we'll draw the comparisons, but in, in terms of leadership, it's kind of like, if you get 99% of it right, surely that's better than concentrating on the 1%. So, and the second piece that I wanted to kind of, um, uh, I guess, discuss around singing is, it's that flirtation with risk. Mm. There's there's always to perform at an optimum. There is always a risk that you will th enter some level of failure or encounter some level of failure. I mean, mm. it's kind of like that level that that skill level that's required is just so high, and you're flirting with that risk. But that actually feeds the adrenaline slightly, in so much as you're on that yeah. precipice of like, oh my god, I'm just absolutely on fire and then invariably as any human unless you're a massive narcissist in the back of your mind it's like watch out yeah watch out there might be a mistake coming uh i am gonna ask the second question answer the second question first because yeah. i can't quite remember the first one so we'll come back to it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i i i so that there's that there's that there is something that i think uh so when when i was leaving uni i was like i had a really i mean I love history of art. I did history of art at uni. It's mm. great. I love the subject, but it's deeply unemployable, right? I didn't do economics, right? <laughs> okay. So when I came out of uni and I didn't really have any work experience, I did like little, little bits and bobs, so I wasn't, as I said, I wasn't the internship, you know, every mm. summer kind of guy. And I, so I did spend a lot of time talking about singing as it like related to my teamwork and all this stuff. And I, mm. and I think maybe I was kind of CV, trying to, trying to make myself seem something, but actually the more I thought about it, the more it did teach me a lot. And one of the things it really did teach me is about uh, about failure, about risk, about um, also self belief. I think so. When I started singing in in Claire, the the I was really not very good uh, at singing uh, in a in like a way that uh, the director like only let me in the choir because he needed he just like he needed an extra body and he and he himself has said he had sleepless nights over letting me in because I was not good. Um, and I was also terrified of singing alone, like solos and stuff. I remember doing my first ever solo in that choir, you know, a few weeks in, like a little tiny solo, because you do mm. religious services. It's a chapel choir, so you do religious services, and it was like, you know, three bars of music. Mm. My legs were shaking, like I was terrified. Mm. 
And I think the journey over four years in that choir, the journey over four years of getting better at singing um, taught me two things. I guess it taught me, the first thing is taught me how to deal with nerves and to d deal yeah. with like breathing mm -hmm. um, and uh, centering yourself in your body. Um, when when things are going bad, the ability to say, okay, it's going to be fine. This is the same thing as excitement. And how can I use this to generate energy? And it taught me about in order to be successful, you have to acknowledge the potential for failure. There's something that singers talk about a lot, like or at least my voice part. Everyone's terrified, especially as a young, this is very niche chat for people, but like as a as a young tenor, everyone's worried about cracking. You know, you sing and then your voice goes, yeah. and it's really embarrassing, right? Um, and so lots and lots of young people, wor they hold back because they're worried about that mistake. But actually in order to sing at your best, you need to acknowledge that, that might happen, but you've got to let the breath flow and you just got to go for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, that lesson of sort of like live, like it's about living on that little yeah. bleeding edge. Um, but that's where you find real success. Yeah, 100%. Is the thing that I think like has stayed with me a lot, yeah. you know? I think you say it's a niche chat. I don't. I don't think so. I think you can extrapolate all of that out into you as a leader in a startup. So if you think about, mm. obviously, that particular choir master appearing to take a risk on you, yeah. warm body, right? Oh, but, he, he, but, he still tells me about it. We were at yeah. a wedding the other day, and he was telling me about it. So. There must have been something that quelled his risk barometer, if you will, to sort of say, look. Let's let's let Lawrence mm. try, right? Secondly, you were nervous, incredibly yeah. nervous, but your passion for music still motivated you to go there and do that. Completely yeah. out of your comfort zone. You're just like, no, I, my passion for this is so strong. I'm going to put myself in this situation where I know I'm going to be nervous, where I know I'm going to be massively self-aware, yeah. but you still did it. And then you achieved entry into the choir. Yeah. And that started on a journey of kind of discovery, you know, greater learnings through the collaboration of being part of that choir. Clearly, you took instruction very well. You took feedback very well because you developed as a singer. So I, I see a lot of kind of similarities there in terms of mindset for somebody that then is going to go and on to be a co-founder yeah. of a business, right? Do you, do, do, I, think, do you I think I think um, the thing that I was thinking about during that, when you were talking, I think the the thing that Graham saw and that I feel like I do have is a sense of determination. Yeah. 100%. And like kind of just stubbornness, really. Um, and like and passion. I think yeah. those those, you know, I I really when I care about something mm. and when I want something, mm. I am I yeah, I I am incredibly determined to achieve it and I mm. and I will in some ways kind of like bury myself to 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 get into that goal and wanting mm. to get better i think that one of the things that i i guess i i like about myself is that is that determination to get better mm. that belief in always wanting to learn and grow mm. and also the determination to find success whatever that might look like and i think that probably is what graham saw this kind of tenacious little Oh yeah. You know, and I, I've been like that since I was quite young, you know, yeah. like I was, I was pretty certain about, you know, where I wanted to go to uni pretty early. Yep. I was pretty, I was pretty certain about what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this really, you know, history of art. My mum spent tr years trying to convince me it wasn't a good idea for my career and my <laughs> prospects. And I was like, no, I want to do that. I'm only going to do that. I only yeah. care about that. Yeah. It's, you know, it's focus, fo focus. Yeah. Fo focus on a result, like yeah. very results orientated. Um, very determined to 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 do something and willing and also kind of I guess willing to I don't know I don't want it's, to it's willing to put the work in without without kind of without not not in a way that's no holds barred no not in a way that's kind of hustle culture like yeah, yeah. like at all costs yeah um, I think that's something I'm learning as I'm growing you mm. know that that like everything in life does come with the cost and sometimes that cost is quite high yeah but uh, definitely seeing a goal and being willing mm. to dedicate yourself to achieving it. I think we'll get into it because I, I think, you know, like I say, seeing you in the environment of the mothership, there are so many other qualities that I don't think you probably reflect on. They're just part of, you see it as part of your personality, mm -hmm. but actually when you lean into those as a leader, I think they, they have this magnifying effect. Mm. But 
We'll we'll reverse engineer slightly in terms of you mentioned your first startup, and I'm looking at like Hello Tomorrow, MBF. We know was was Hello Tomorrow the first Hello tomorrow? Yeah, what's on there? Marketing strategy executive. Um. Oh, Hello Tomo. Hello Tomo. Uh, Hello there Tomo. We go. Yeah. So it would be useful if I pronounce yeah, it yeah, right. Yeah. You're like, so that that was my come from. So 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 that was my brother's company. So nice. so like I my journey like I guess. Uh, I don't know if you're ever going to ask me about this, but it's funny. Funny that my all my brothers have started businesses. So I've got four brothers. Wow. And, um, and where got, are you in the? I'm in, fifth. I'm uh, fifth. Okay. So my dad. My dad's are quite old. So my my I've got three so you're half your youngest. brothers. I'm the youngest by thirty years. My three half brothers are like much older than me. Yeah. And then I've got um, a brother with with my with my mum yep. and and me. All of them started business. My dad started businesses. And so my 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 brother's business, Hello Tomo, he was this. It was a mental health app. Um, yeah. It just got sold to to a big mental health company called iCast World. And um, yeah, I was there. At, I was at MVF, and I I was like really trying to help. And he was, yeah. you know, I was trying to help him out. And he gave me this job just before I started at in my in my in my first job, saying like, hey, just like let's work out how to do this marketing strategy for this app. It's yeah. Like it's quite ahead of its time. Actually, it was you know it. It's um, it was a chatbot for therapy. Well, you think so, about the health tech space now; it's like massive, massive right? yeah. It still, is a chatbot for therapy, and I was there yeah. in his little like it was my first experience of startup life. You know, a little studio in Kennington, yeah. like sitting around a whiteboard, going, "Okay, how the hell do we market this thing to exactly. people? What do people want?" Researching the market, yeah. Well, and equally as well, there probably wasn't really a, any established market for it, right? Yeah. So you're essentially trying to introduce a tech play into a very traditional yeah. marketplace. And 2016, you, you know, like I, I think weirdly, you always forget how quickly the world has changed. But 2016, yeah. therapy was not like, it was nowhere near the same, um, you know, it was nowhere near as big a thing as it yeah. is now. It was nowhere near as acknowledged. Yeah. Certainly by employers. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in, in that. So doing that, first startup, MBF, yeah. what did what did you take from MBF? What, I mean, because anybody who knows a company, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, a well-established, recognised company with right. a real kind of high achiever culture. I mean, yeah. it's it's kind of like it's it's kind of like the tour de force in terms of a working environment. What did you take from that? Right. What were your takeaways when you you kind of started there, and then perhaps now you reflect back on moving on from there? Because there's still relationships you have mm. from those days. So yeah. it's obviously been a really healthy experience for you personally in terms of your growth. Definitely, I think um, I would have never thought that. Uh, my first company would have stayed with me in the same way yeah. that it has. Mm -hmm. um, MVS is an amazing place to work. I think uh, it's it it was. I, I kind of I, I look back back on it. It's it's been a, like it was it was an incredibly, um, an incredibly permissive place to grow. Mm -hmm. So that culture allowed people to chase any development they wanted. Mm -hmm. It, I was, you know, uh, less than a year, six months into my career, and I was managing media budgets in the hundreds of thousands. Mm. I, I was, I was on this big growth journey. Like the company was growing loads, and you're just given responsibility everywhere. And it was, you know, I was 24, managing a team of four people. It was managing like a proper, you know, like, you know, essentially like being part of the senior team of a proper PL. Um, really young. And I think that just gave people the opportunity to grow really fast in themselves. Um, really though, the thing that, that mattered the most is the relationships you built. And I think it's, it's a really looking back on it. It's sort of this extraordinary skill that they had. And I don't really know how they did it to hire people that would all just really get on. Yeah. And I bumped into someone I worked with actually last night and he's still friends with a whole group of people. I'm still friends with people who are still there. I've got a whole group of friends who, who've left now and all done amazing, brilliant things. And um, it just felt like a really together time. And, yeah. it, and it created a culture of real togetherness, which, which I think people underestimate because in your first job, you assume that's what every job is like. Yeah, it um, sets a benchmark, right? It sets a real benchmark and a real benchmark of expectation for you know how much... Um, change you can affect in an organization yeah um and the style of organization it was you know it was actually it was really progressive like yeah. really heavy feedback culture mm. high performance culture um real belief in work-life balance but mm. um you know with with punchy goals that people yeah. wanted to achieve and really managed to get a lot of people behind that mm. it did help that they took everyone to ibiza uh when, once when, a year so well when we hit target so that yeah. was a pretty good incentive for yeah, people yeah. but 
Yeah, it was awesome. And people yeah. talk about it like it's an extension of uni. You know, it was really fun. It's a fun, <laughs> that sounds fun amazing. time. Yeah. Reflecting on that time, what did it give you most? Did it give you most in terms of capability, experience, knowledge? Did you feel like it started to inform or were there any points that during that part of the journey where you were like, I'm moving into kind of almost a like leadership space mm. now? So I think it, 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 it definitely taught me that. It gave me that uh, leadership thing, mm. I guess. I, I, I think that was the experience I had as I moved through the organization, mm. um, especially when I went into a more of a strategic role. I think the thing it started to teach me is about managing working relationships, yeah. building trust, yeah. um, building relationships internally. I think that was the thing that it taught me the most. It also yeah. taught me numbers, which was, you know, was hugely important. I think, mm. I, you know, as I said, arts, arts education, mm. um, a lot of essays, a lot of writing, a lot of thinking, and no numbers. And I remember my first interview for, for MVF, the guy interviewing me just wrote Excel and a big question mark in mm. his own interview notebook. And I was like, oh, that's not gone well. You know, yeah. like I had no idea what a pivot table was or anything. And, and it gave me such a rigorous training in that, mm. that you actually gained a lot of confidence in yourself for that yeah. um, thing. And then it taught you the relationships and the importance yeah. of those things. And I was really lucky to be there at that time where I yeah. basically got the opportunity to experience, I guess, in a, in a, in a controlled environment, what it's mm. like to, to lead a team um, and to be leaned on for responsibility, to be responsible, to be accountable for numbers, to be accountable performance and, mm. and to be the person to say, okay, well, this went well and this didn't. So yeah, I, it, it was an amazing place to learn. That sounds awesome. And then you left there, growth lead for what looks like probably about kind of 12 months. And then I assume at some point, the conversation around the mothership started mm. to develop probably pre-2021. I don't know whether that was kind of something that started to get discussed in 2020. Um, how did how did that come about? How did that opportunity present itself? Yeah, it's, it's a, it, was a, it was a strange story, I guess. I, I, so I left MVF in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I wanted to do tech startup work. I think kind of because of this sort of everyone had started a business and I always kind of knew I wanted to explore it, but I, I guess have this well, I mean, I guess we'll come on to it, but I have this kind of strange attitude to risk where I'm simultaneously really into risk and simultaneously really terrified of risk. So I, I thought actually what I should do is learn about them. So I went yeah. and worked in some startups and um, had an amazing experience um, working at uh, first, first, firstly a fitness app and then at um, a fintech called Iwaka where yeah, I, I kind of- East and Iwaka. Yeah, 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 and I and I, and I really loved that. And I mm. think, um, but I always knew I always knew that I wanted the opportunity to try and start it. And I think um, to me, I was trying to reflect on this ahead of the podcast, like why, mm. what happened? Yeah. I think really it's a testament to, to relationship building. Yeah. Um, uh, suddenly the guy who founded MVF, Titus Sharp, mm. uh, who's now chairman of the mothership, um, called me up and basically said, hey, do you want to start a company? Um, it was out of the blue. I was on a yeah. walk. I was on a walk in Victoria Park. Yeah. Um, and it was cold. It was like December, um, mm. uh, 2020, maybe January, 2021. I can't quite remember. And, yeah. and it was like, um, suddenly this opportunity presented itself out of nowhere. And mm. I think, uh, it's very easy to reflect on that in your, in your moments, be like, oh, I was just, you know, it was all luck and it was, it was incredibly lucky, but it's also maybe testament to something where. I, I did build strong relationships in those uh, throughout that career. And I, and I kind of felt like, um, mm. when someone thought about, oh, I need this person to yep. come and help me, I was that. And that this number. is what I talk about that, that magnifying effect. I think it's kind of the relationships clearly that you built and yeah. the work that you did stands as a kind of testament for you. Right. So yeah. it's kind of almost like that's the reference point that people have now clearly like say Titus has observed that mm. obviously, and, and seen that. And then start to think about creating a new business. And he, and to your point, he's like, if I'm going to put together a co-founding team, I need these skills, experience, mm. and and actually these personalities. Mm. And he's identified you mm. as one of those kind of key foundational elements. And I think mm. I think that's again, it's kind of it's one of those things where it's easy to reflect back on now. Yeah. But in that moment, you've clearly built this momentum and this magnifying effect. And it's it's important to continue to sort of develop those relationships, keep that 
reference point fresh in people's minds and and not kind of almost reverse engineer and go into a bit of a, a kind of silo right i'm in this company now this is my sole focus this is the only thing i'm focusing on yeah i think um for me for me one of the things that i actually find the most joy in mm. is relationship building i think yeah. um it's something that i feel it comes quite naturally to me i guess yeah. um because I, I think community is a big part of, of who I am as a person. I think yeah. it's a big part of my value system. It's what keeps me sane. Mm. Um, <laughs> not quite sane. Um, <laughs> like, I think, uh, you know, but it, it's, it's, it's really important to me. So, yeah. so keeping up with people, finding out what's going on, mm. always being someone who's willing to offer advice or help or thought, yeah. um, has st stood me in better stead than I thought it would. And I think, um, it helps to have, yeah. uh, you know, really good relationships and build good relationships at yeah. work. But, but yeah, I mean, it's it's paid massive dividends for me, and I feel very grateful for that. Yeah. Um, because I guess I, um, it sounds silly not to say I didn't do it. I I didn't don't feel like I did it consciously. I think that that is sort of just part of who I am. I'm always searching for connection. You know, <laughs> like that is and kind it, of this is I, the thing. It comes back to that kind of things that you do naturally that you may not be aware have a magnifying mm. effect. I mean, I remember the first time we met and we first had a conversation. What were your just, first impressions of me? Come I was on, just man. like incredibly warm individual, <laughs> like really kind of just engaging straight. Right. It, it removed perhaps some of the expected formalities of an initial first meeting yeah. and straight into the, I think the thing that I was thinking was your question was, who is this person? You were exploring immediately. Yeah. You wanted to remove the kind of formality and just get to who is this person? I yeah. want to understand a bit more about them. Um, and I just felt like an immediate rapport. Yeah, that's and nice. Fun. That's great. I, I really came away just smiling from the from the meeting. I was just like, I kind of love that guy. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Well, yeah. <laughs> and it's and but that's you just being you. Yeah. Now you think about the that's that's the first impression I got of you. Yeah. And that builds the foundation for, you know, a kind of development of a, a kind of friendship, working relationship, all those yeah. sort of things. Can you imagine how powerful that is when you're building a business? And ultimately you're talking about people, people, product, and then profit, profit, mm. right? And if you don't get the people right, product, profit doesn't come. Uh, well, it, uh, this is the moment where you you take that as a compliment. Yeah, I'm not going to do that very well. It's, exactly, that's, that's not something that yeah. you do well. You're just like, oh my god, I can't just... deal with it. I can't deal with feeling but, good about myself. Yeah, exactly, yeah. but it is it's so important as a co-founder founder, founder mm. to to really be aware of just the things that you do naturally because of that's the personality you are, but actually understand that the the power and impact mm. that has on people around you. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I think I think uh just to reflect on what you're saying, I, I think one of the things that I do feel about businesses in general, mm -hmm. uh, and about about what it takes to build and create a team is that relationships, people, culture are mm -hmm. kind of everything. Yeah. Uh it maybe sounds like a generic thing to say, but it has been my biggest reflection that building companies is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Um and uh it, there will never be a moment where it's not, there's not something on fire. There's not something going wrong. I shouldn't say <laughs> on fire, really. It's a really, I, I don't know why I say that, but like, it does always feel like there are so many different things you have to fix and you kind of have to fix one, but that doesn't mean you're not stressed about the others. Yeah. And in order to get through that, in order to um, be together through those challenging times, relationships, people, togetherness, the ability to communicate in a truthful mm. and open way, that's the thing that that for me has been the only way I saw yeah. of getting through anything. And I, you know, I think different people have different styles, but for me, that, that, that's the biggest lesson. Mm. It's like, actually, Hey, this is, this is really important. And, and for me, that's something that I feel good at, you yeah. know, and, and when you're building your career or you're building your, your company, it's important to understand what, what open doors you can push on. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I probably could be better at a lot of things. I definitely could be better at pretty much everything. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be able to add something, you know, in a conversation about finance, mm. my CFO is extraordinarily brilliant human being, mm. um, way more intelligent than me and way better at finance than me. But, um, I know I can build a good relationship with him and we can have a difficult conversation about the fact I probably want to spend quite a lot of money and he won't <laughs> let me, um, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, but I, we can have that conversation in a good way, yeah. in a useful way, rather than a way that's, or he can have a conversation with me, which is like, actually, you know, we've got to, we've got to be careful here. Mm. And instead of me feeling like Obi's sort of 
treading on my toes, I yep. can feel actually this is, you know, I know that he really gives a crap. Um, yeah, 100%. He does it as well. Um, yeah, he does. Top guy, top guy. I want to take you back to that conversation with Titus. Yeah. Did that feel like the natural next step for you because co-founder, founder, whatever title, I've been building businesses and scaling businesses for years, so this is the natural next step? Or did you have to check yourself and be like, okay, so, so this, is a, this is a big next step and I need to really think about what this means for me? I, I wish I could tell you that it wasn't. <laughs> I'm an anxious person. I have an anxious personality and I had a probably, you know, I think probably like a four to six week panic attack um, really? about like how big a step that was. And, okay. and, and I think it's something that I was quite conscious that I always wanted to do. And I probably always knew that I was going to do it. Mm. But as I said, I have this weird, like um, my dad is like uh, an extraordinary person who started uh, lost business in the creative in the creative world and he's mm. you know he trained as an artist and he's he's an incredibly creative person yeah. and he was always trying to encourage me to kind of become a singer or go mm. and run an art gallery or become a curator or you know start my own business because mm. all of his all of his sons had done done that and he's got this like he has got like an incredibly yeah, like an unhinged attitude to risk like he just doesn't really understand risk yeah. he just loves doing stuff right yeah. but my mum is like what what about insurance have yeah. you thought about have you thought about <laughs> something more thought stable. about law <laughs> you know something more stable um and i have this like i think i think most of my brothers have gotten really you know much better it, they, they find the kind of risk-taking mm. uh piece really comes naturally to them and I, it does to me to a certain extent but i have this pull yeah, I have yeah. this moment of like, hey, hang on, what's this? What's the cost of this going to be? Is this the right thing for me? Mm. Um, and and so I I probably did in that moment have that real. I want to do it. I don't, yeah. You know, how do I do it? But but I knew that it was a massive step. Okay. Um, but I knew it was a step that I wanted to take, and it was always something that I wanted to do. And it comes, you know, coming back to that focus thing. Mm. You know, you set yourself goals, you set yourself um, ambitions, and you never know a when they're going to come, when the opportunity is going to come, and b uh, what they're going to look like exactly. Yeah. And this was definitely, in some ways, like not because I'd been working in tech, right? I was expecting to at some point start a tech company, yeah. and we're buying e-commerce businesses, and it's it's tech enabled, but it's it's selling stuff, right? Yeah, it's exactly, selling yeah. physical products. So so it was it was different, and it looked different. Um, but I knew that I was always going to say yes. I kind of feel like the only thing I've done really throughout my career is just say yes to stuff you know right. the reason i'm here is i said yes i'm quite you know i'm quite nervous you know but i want to say yes i want to yeah. have experiences it comes back to that curiosity i want to find out what it's like to record yeah. a podcast to start a business to back to that audition for the choir, yeah yeah right? yeah you know jelly legs nervous yeah. but you knew within yourself that there must be an just either a, a quiet voice that says you can do this you can definitely do this. You've got to, I mean, there's got to be that element where you you back yourself. Now, either it's, I know if I can secure this opportunity or this and, and make this next step, I know I can learn really quickly and I can deploy that learning really quickly. And that's a, that's a really key thing, right? It's like being able to absorb learning and then but actually yeah. deploy it and make it actionable. <clears throat> and it, I guess maybe perhaps there's an element of that. There's that just in the back of your mind, you know, in front of mind, it's like, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> but in the back of your mind, you're like, you can do this, Lawrence. I think, I think it is, there probably is a part of that. You know, like I, I think there's definitely a part of me that feels um, like I, I can back myself to at least give it a really good shot. Yeah. Um, and also there's a sort of like bloody mindedness. You know, there's a sort of like, I know that you don't think I can and I'm mm. going to, you know, I kind of feel like the moment someone says I can't do something is when I really oh, want right. to, I want to kind of prove it to them. And there's, yeah. there's something about like determination to, mm. to, to, to keep going, to keep going through the hunt, to keep pushing mm. that I think defines a lot of what I, what I want to, what how i kind of act yeah. um and yeah i think that probably does come with self-confidence i i think confidence is something that i've always really struggled with since i was really young like i think mm. uh finding kind of uh love for myself and all of those yeah. things is something that's that i don't know probably for whatever reason i don't know if we have it's not a therapy session but like you know it's, it's something that 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 I, I i sort of battle with i guess a lot but that doesn't mean that i don't think that i have all the capabilities to achieve yeah. I and i really do believe i do have that yeah I think it's it's just a, a very 
human thing to yeah. to to kind of i think well it's interesting that and again this comes back to that magnifying effect you sort of say you know you, you say exactly what's on your mind actually from from a leadership perspective again that's that's really reassuring mm-hmm. for the people around you that you can be vulnerable in moments but still make a decision mm. um you can openly analyze and you know and gather opinions so that everybody collectively feels like they're they're moving forward together as opposed to standing there and we come back to that kind of like alpha narcissist leader who's like i'm not going to tell anybody that i don't know what mm. i'm doing but i'm going to make a decision anyway yeah i think i think i have uh like a I have a sort of semi visceral reaction to to the bullshit of it. Like I don't, I just can't. I feel, I feel like I personally would much rather be sort of talked to in a real way about stuff that isn't going well, stuff that um, you know that we need to go to do better, stuff that I need to do better. Mm-hmm. Um, in a way that I can like that, but make, that makes me feel that that we can do it together. Yeah. Um, and there is something about being in front of someone who's desperately, you can see them desperately trying to make something feel like way better than it is or just trying to avoid a subject, basically. Yeah. Um, that I think I just, I, I find really difficult because yeah. actually I, I just want to have an honest conversation. Yeah. Um, and even if the conversation is, you know, that maybe there are things you can't say, yeah. but it, at the very least, it makes you feel like there's a togetherness, that yeah. there's a truth and I think that truth, I, you know, human beings seek connection. They, mm. they, everyone does naturally seek connection and they, they seek truth. And I think a lot of what leadership is, is about how to communicate truth yeah. in a way that galvanizes people and motivates people. Every, people think that honesty and difficult conversations are going to make people feel crap. And maybe, but actually often the avoidance of that makes people feel worse. Exactly. Yeah. It's kind of offering transparency, even if it is, can create a bit of, kind of stress or maybe an uncomfortable scenario the idea about being transparent is to get past that uncomfortable difficult piece yeah and get to a point where there's a solution where everybody feels like they can move forward and address the <laughs> learnings in it right as well it's um i mean admittedly <laughs> and idealistically that's what you'd want to happen on a daily basis the reality in a startup is you don't often have the time to be able mm. to do that in every single yep. situation i always refer to this kind of almost like um jfdi moment where it's just like just fucking do it the learning is at the other end yeah let's not discuss what we need to do right now and explore it it's like trust me in this situation the learning is at the end you Mm -hmm. just need to take action um and i wonder what and this is not a question for you it's just a a throw out comment it's like i wonder how what kind of balance leaders in startups put to that you know the the sort of jfdi versus a slightly more collaborative and 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 kind of consultative approach because it's the way i approach it within my team is i give myself three jfdi cards a year okay so it's quite literally and how and how are you how are you playing that card are you like in a meeting be like guys i'm cutting this short we're just gonna fucking do it i think or well you, I can is, think it, is it sort of like quite is it quite directive or yeah. is it sort of it's di- it's directive okay. it's, it's kind of to, to that point it's like we could we could go on a like a journey and a, a conversation right. here, but you will get more learnings okay. at the end of that action. Okay, yeah. And oftentimes, I use a JFDI card to push people out of their comfort zones. Yeah, it's just like okay. look, the learning is that you'll feel better at the end of yep. this. I know it feels uncomfortable, just fucking do it. Just do it. Yeah, okay. And then we we move forward from there. And I think I, I struggled with the idea of that initially because mm. it felt like it almost pushed against my value set. Mm, mm. But actually, when I think about the things like transparency, when I think about, you know, just kind of generally being honest, mm. it it kind of, it does align if it's used in the right way. I, I think Thoughts? that's, uh, it's, uh, it's super interesting, man. I think, I think uh, my first reaction is like, I feel like you can do, every team is different yeah. and every style of business is different. Yeah. So I think there are going to be more people who lean into that JFDI stuff and those people who don't. And I think what's really interesting on my observation of you and your team is that what you've done is built really high trust. So in that moment where it's directive, yeah. people really believe that they that that you do have their best interests at heart, that you do care and that you have enough experience and have not enough knowledge to 
for them to kind of trust you when mm. when you're pushing them off the cliff, you they yeah. trust that you've got a bungee cord and you'll pull them back up. Um, I think if if you jump into doing this stuff and jump into working with a team and leading a team without building that trust, mm. um, it can be really, really easy for that moment to become very toxic. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I definitely am someone who struggled uh, at times with decision making. And for some reason, I always remember actually one of the founders of MBF who, who wasn't Titus um, once I, I was really struggling with decisions. Um, and I was like, I just don't know how to make this decision. He was like, Lawrence, um, sometimes making a decision is better, better than not making a decision. Actually, always it is. Mm. And what you need to do is you need to get yourself into a room, give yourself some time, give yourself an hour, get all the information you possibly can. And at the end of that hour, you're walking out of the room and you're making a decision. Yeah. And there's that time boxing of like, because it's so easy to discuss and discuss and discuss. And I think actually one of the things about building businesses is everything is uncertain. Yeah. You never know when you're going to go and you never know where the market's going to, like, you know, we started a consumer goods business and a year later or two, a year and a year and a half later, you know, yeah. the economy's really struggling, consumers in a really difficult place. Of course, mm. we didn't plan for that. Yeah. Um, but so, so you can't ever know yeah. Um, you can only ever get the best information you can and make the decision, but make sure that decision yeah. is is final and people run with it and people go through with it and you communicate that direction clearly. Yeah. Um, so I I personally feel like setting the groundwork yeah. is the most important thing to then be able to make decisions. Definitely. Um, and and I think ever as with anything, it comes back to that thing: people trust relationships yeah. and it's and it's culture that really allows you to to be directive to to make yeah. decisions and to allow those people to then go along with it. Because otherwise you can sit in a room and say, just fucking do it. Yeah. And people are like, nope, yeah. I don't <laughs> so want to do it. No You're chance. an asshole. No <laughs> I don't wanna, you know what I mean? Like you yeah. don't want that to happen. 100%. And that's incredibly kind feedback as well. Thank you. Um, it's kind of, uh, that trust base is, is absolutely key. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really key. So as you said, well, I mean, for you now, it's like 18 months into the mothership. Oh, it's going to be, Oh, it's uh, it's two, two, over two years now. It's March well, March twenty twenty one. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of what are the so what is the one thing yeah. if you can that you perhaps expected to happen that did happen or didn't happen? Okay, and then well, let's start there. What you know when you had that call with with Titus, you decided to join the mothership as a co founder. Yeah. You probably had line of sight at the, the other co founders coming into yeah. that as well. So there was you know conversations yeah. and meetings, and it, in that moment where you're like, okay, we're going to do this. Yeah, is there was there a single thing that you were like, this is totally going to happen, or something <laughs> that something that you didn't expect that did that's been really surprising? Yes, uh, I'm going to give a, maybe a bit of a cheat answer. Which is the one thing want. I expected to happen was it was going to be a hell of a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's good. I, I was talking to uh, our CEO the other day and he asked me, um, you know, uh, how, how do you think it's going? You know, how do you, and I was like, exactly as I expected because it's really, really hard. Yeah. And, and that, that is basically what I expected. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. It doesn't mean it's not, you know, exciting and, and mm -hmm. full of adrenaline and possibility, but, but, I feel like there's this thing that happens and maybe, maybe, maybe it's because this is, I guess, the third kind of small business and startup business that I've tried mm -hmm. to try to be in. But there is this something that everyone wants to sell the dream and everyone sells the dream to themselves and to everyone around them. Yeah. And um, you see yourself when you start a business, you see yourself at the start where it's all scrappy and cool and yeah. really fun. And you're like trying to build stuff. And, and then you see it yourself uh, 10 years later in the Maldives, you've got, you know, a pina colada <laughs> and you're like, this is great. You know, but the bit in between, you actually have to build a business. 100%. And building a business comes with loads of stuff, loads of left field stuff that you would yeah. never have expected. So I guess the thing that I expected was it was going to be hard. And, okay. and it has been. Um, but, but that doesn't mean it wasn't exciting. Yeah. Um, but that kind of segues neatly into my next question, which is what are one, two, or the three of the biggest challenges you've, you've had to encounter? Um, well, Ooh. everyone says raising money, and raising yeah. money was, is difficult. Yeah. Um, and for, I think actually, I mean, look, I, I didn't have much experience beforehand of, of even the, the process of it, but mm. I think the thing I've learned, one of the things I've learned is raising good money. Uh, and yeah. that, and I think that is something that a lot of, especially first time founders, especially mm. young founders don't think about. Yeah. Um, what the value of a, of kind money is and good money Define is. That. What does that mean? I think um, there are a lot of, you know, I, I 
I have huge amounts of respect for the VC industry and, mm. and kind of and venture funding and people taking huge risks with other people's money. Mm. Uh, but I also think that a lot of venture funding and a lot of startups think they have to go to venture capital in order to raise money. And mm. actually, sometimes that money is very expensive. Yeah. Sometimes that comes with um, investors, you know, setting the amount of money they're going to take out of the business, regardless of uh, regardless of how much yeah. it's sold for, or exactly. um, taking large percentages of the business, which means that. By the time you actually build something, mm. the founders don't own very much of it at all and actually don't get that value out of it. Mm. Um, so I mean things like that. Money that allows you to actually execute the execute your plan, but also be agile with it. I mean, I remember, mm. you know, we were talking to people, you know, we we got into our industry at a point where it was blowing up. Yeah. And everyone thought that people were going to, we, you know, the Amazon aggregator industry, for those who don't know, like, you know, it was a really big moment, you know, $12 billion or something like that was raised to buy these small Amazon businesses. And the mothership kind of started in that area. Right. Yeah. Um, and we were having conversations quite early with people with kind of venture debt funds and kind of debt funds who was, who were basically trying to say, well, we'll give you this money, but you have to buy businesses that are 80% FBA that, that you, and they, you know, can only do this thing. And they're basically trying, they, they re, they thought that they knew the business model, um, before, before the, before the model had even had a chance to spin out. Um, yeah. and the model was only like two years old, but they were sort of saying, well, this money comes with all these caveats. Mm. And our reaction was like, well, we don't know, yeah. you know, we think Amazon businesses are cool, but there are lots and lots of risks here. So yeah. why would we take this money if it was not going to allow us to be more agile and buy different styles of businesses? And I think yeah. we were really lucky and incredibly lucky to find, um, you know, find people to give us money who were much more uh, permissive of us to be able to explore exactly. and find, uh, you know, tech companies talk about finding product mm. market fit. It's kind of the same with us. We mm. Our product is essentially cash, mm. um, and uh, but we have to find the right place to deploy that cash in order to get a return. And you're never going to know that before you've actually tried to do it a lot. So you yeah. need you need that. I guess coming space back to the point, yeah, you need to, space, yeah, to to, to actually um, give the model time to breathe, yeah. to to be able to pivot, and, and to know and to know what kind of business you're going to be. And I yeah. think that's the other thing is like I guess for me, one of the big learnings has been understanding that there are con some kind of businesses that work for venture, yeah. you know, big SaaS company, we're going to IPO for hundred X, it's going to be crazy. Mm. And there are other companies that maybe work for different styles of businesses that yeah. are going to be profit making, that are going to be sustainable, that are going to last for 25 years. They're not going to last for three mm. years and maybe, maybe become YouTube or maybe just die. And I think mm. a lot of that nuance was something I didn't really think yeah, about. Yeah. I think when you said sort of kind money, my immediate thought was the expectation that comes with that investment like we say from vcs and stuff like that that could end up changing the course of the business yeah and actually changing the direction of it based on that expectation yeah um and i think we've we've read enough about businesses that have ended up completely changing course yeah. in terms of their products and service because the vc uh all the emphasis from their their investors mm -hmm. has actually made it so yeah and then you know when it hits you know when it when it hits hits the beach and it's just kind yeah. of like rudderless you're just kind of like did nobody really see this coming? I think I think it is just difficult. You know, I I, I feel like the VC model uh, it requires a certain style of business, mm. and I think some of the best VCs are the VCs who will openly acknowledge the founders that hey, actually, you know, you could you could have a really good business here that doesn't have to take this money. That we don't mm. have to go on this journey where you have to mm. triple in size every year, hire a hundred thousand, you know, a hundred, hundred people a year, mm. um, be in this kind of really aggressive growth trajectory mm. because actually maybe there's a really good business here. And what the risk we're trying to do that is that you might blow up mm. and you're going to be burning cash, burning cash and burning cash. And then an environment like we're in comes up yeah. where VCs are sitting on their hands. They don't want to give any more money. Mm. And these businesses are, in this moment been told that they were going to, that the money tap was there and they're just going to burn cash. And suddenly they're going to have to fire everyone because actually yeah. they need to, re they need to pull back. And I think, I don't think we, as a, I kind of, I guess, I don't want to speak for the startup ecosystem, but like, mm. you know, we need to find different ways and different styles and we need to open entrepreneurs eyes to different mm. styles of funding that can be available um, to take your business where you want it to go. You yeah. know, sometimes everyone wants to be on a rocket ship and that's, super exciting of course um and it is of course yeah, yeah. super cool uh it's terrifying super, yeah. super cool um but also sometimes people want to build a really great business yeah you know i think that comes down to that that's that, 
sorry, not a really great business, a long and like sustainable business. Yeah, Everyone's exactly. got a really great business, but you know what yeah. I mean? I th- you're right. I think it's that there has been this kind of myth perpetuated about it, you know, accelerated growth, you know, kind mm. of like that, that kind of whole rocket ship journey piece, but actually surely, and I think this is perhaps shaping the, the thinking of the market now is mm. investors want to invest in businesses with sustainable growth mm. potential. Mm. Um, and they're prepared to hold on to their money till they see yeah. evidence and signs that businesses can do that and can almost I guess it's almost like, you know, that there's a withdrawing cash to see which businesses fail because ultimately they weren't built on the right foundations. Yep. And then whoever's left, okay, those are the sustainable businesses and we can start to think about investing in those, but not at the same levels of investment that we would have previously. So it's it's um it's almost like a quite awful way of leveling and and kind of removing some of the businesses that are so unstable built on a house of cards kind of scenario you know yeah i I think i think there are lots of businesses that start with amazing ideals but don't really start with an understanding of how to monetize Mm. and the fundamental metrics of of Mm. revenue profit ebitda margin and i think that that again coming back to where i've been i'm incredibly privileged and lucky Mm. to have ended up a working with experienced entrepreneurs like titus and Mm. and ben who who really really know their stuff and really Mm. care about about this stuff and have been there before where, you know, businesses have have, have fallen fallen foul of, of VCs and fallen foul of this kind of, mm. oh, we're just going to make a product that's wonderful mm. um, and we'll, we'll worry about monetization later. Um, and, and teaching you about the fundamentals of real business. You know, yeah. you buy something for this and you sell it for more and you make a margin and and, and then you use that cash to fund your, mm. your growth. And I think all of those things are incredibly i like i'm so grateful for that to, to that that kind of almost grounding of like um it's not to say that tech companies uh, the tech companies i worked in weren't concerned about that but in many ways you're trying to find you know a use for your product you're finding all of these things and mm. i remember in my first business when we suddenly started suddenly realized we had to monetize and we had to change the product completely because it was a free product everyone was using it we were like great everyone's using this product and now we ask people to pay for it and no one wants to pay for it yeah um and it's so easy to go down that rabbit hole and then be like, oh crap. Um, and so if you start early, realizing that actually within with this, you have to, of course, you need to think about consumers. Of course, of course you need to have a mission that yeah. people are excited about. But actually, also, you need to understand what your fundamentals are. Yeah, 100%. And I think kind of thinking about sort of closing questions and reflecting on everything we've we've kind of discussed are we almost over <laughs> yeah. having too much fun yeah exactly too much fun. right i told just you just chatting right? just chatting, just chatting. Yeah. and it, I, th- I still come back to that that kind of choir audition then yeah and that appetite for risk and putting yourself in a scenario where there is that quiet determination to want to do it and i if we Go from there and fast forward to Lawrence now, yeah. co-founder, 18 months in with the mother- mothership. You've seen a lot of change in that particular industry sector. You've yeah. probably had to make decisions that have come very easily, some decisions that have probably been a little bit more challenging. What are your kind of three takeaways as a co-founder now or your three bits of advice for co-founders in this market right now? What mm. what should they lean into? What should they think about? Because you talked about the business elements, yeah, but actually what are the as a leader, okay. what are the three things that co-founders, founders should be really leaning into at the moment, in your opinion? So that's a tough question. It's a good question. Um, what are you leaning into at the moment? <laughs> Let's go that way. Oh, well, I, I think, I think um, the first thing that I always lean on um, is community. And I mean that, uh, I guess, in two ways, but you know, community, both in the sense of spending conscious time with the people that you love. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm really lucky to have a wonderful partner and wonderful friends and a wonderful community that are kind of almost allows me to step outside of that, but also mm. leaning into the community of the people around you, right? Mm. But like, you know, locking arms with the people around you and knowing that you're going to be, be yeah. with, it, with it. I think, um, from a business point of view, uh, preserve your cash, you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, cash is king and, yeah. and for a reason, uh, and, and be conscious that while, this is a difficult market um it will end Mm -hmm. um and to a certain extent uh people who can hold hold it um Mm -hmm. will reap the benefits yeah um and i guess i mean i just thinking about business things now but i I think as a a leader i think also truth you know communication um telling the truth to people 
mm. um, both in the difficult moments where you mm. you know if you if you have to you know God forbid let be, let people go mm. or or um, drop projects that people want um, yeah. to do. I think don't be afraid to make those hard decisions because yeah. the hard decisions are what will allow you the space to make mm. to to keep going and and find find that stuff that works. I think. Mm. Um, yeah, I think like lean into truth, lean yeah. into lean to what real. Because every, I think a lot of the time, the hard decision is there, and no one wants to see it. Yeah, but actually, it's really important to be like, okay, we've got to do this thing. That uh, kind of links into another question, which is around culture. So, yeah. in these kind of moments where everything's going great, culture is it's an organic thing, right? Yeah. I mean, it's contributed to and detracted from by the people in that in that group in that yeah. business. And in when everybody's in, you know, kind of aligned to this growth journey, it's easier. How do you kind of maintain culture when it's a little bit more challenging? I mean, mm. for, in my mind, I think communication is is probably the first go to. Right? It's kind of like communicate consistently. Communicate. Mm. Is there anything else that you feel or have experienced and or have done that you feel really contributes to maintaining culture? Because with the mothership, I mean, ultimately as well, you think about the dynamics of the business. You're kind of acquiring, you know, kind of small businesses that have mm. kind of established revenue yep. have a you know kind of b2c customer base they're becoming part of the mothership group how do, how do you how do you create this culture of inclusivity when mm. you know that they, they've almost started their mm. journey of culture development as a business before they're they're acquired mm. big question big <laughs> question um i think you know I, look i'm i'll come i'll come back to 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 the fundamental truth which i i i sort of believe that every human being feels the need to connect and craves yeah, connection 100%, yeah um and communication is important but i also think one of the things that we found really helps us is actually just um physically being in the same space you know yeah. we're a hybrid working culture and you know there's a whole other podcast we can do about hybrid working that oh, yeah. i'd love to talk to you about um i'm sure we could have many conversations but yeah, yeah. for me i think that the moments where it's really tough are the moments where you bring people together yeah you know as a leadership team we went away as a group and i think that was massively helpful because yeah. you're in that moment of real challenge mm. your moment that moment where like everything feels like it's falling apart mm. and being together in the same space both to talk about stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know, to talk about strategy, but also just, to, you know, to, to um, you know, have a beer or alternative mm. non-alcoholic beverage yep. or and, 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 and have dinner and eat and break bread and all of these mm. things that actually really matter to people. Yeah. Um, that is the thing that helps us keep going. You know, mm. um, it sounds simple, but I think a lot of people, you know, it, and, and, and to a certain extent, sometimes it's expensive, right? Because yeah. you're getting people from all over the world and they're coming yeah. to place, but that's been massively valuable for us, even through yeah. the difficult times. Oh, that's great. And I think it's, um, it kind of talks to what you want to achieve. As, and so when I think about companies and they talk about their values, mm. the cynic in me could read that and be like, oh, that's, that's a, incredibly yeah. well-crafted yeah, set sure, of values sure. yeah. that have been marketed very yeah. well and then certainly as a kind of talent acquisition recruiter you go into businesses and you want to understand whether it's real or not yeah because ultimately that's what you're taking to the market the talent market to yeah. talk about right because that's the thing that's so important at the moment that currency around values yeah. is something that really is does attract people to a business mm. and want to learn more um, and i think certainly my experience of the mothership is it's true yeah there's truth kind of there, there's say. truth in the values and i think it's and i think the one thing that i really respect is what i call constructively direct that willingness and want to have conversations that may be slightly challenging mm. um or offer opinions that right. may not completely align but be prepared to work and talk through that to get yeah. to an end solution so i think you know if that was well it was intentional um, but you never know whether that will actually manifest into what you want it to be. Yeah. I can tell you it, it has from my experience. My lived experience of being yeah. part of that kind of That's community is, is 100% um, a real thing, a tangible thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, it, it's incredibly kind of you to say. I kind of feel like there's that weird thing that founders do where they always think, or founders or any senior mm -hmm. leader is always, they feel like, uh, yeah, it's going well, but it could be better. You know. Um, and I think that for us, we're always on a seeking path for mm. better communication for better 
ability to have those conversations for better feedback for all of these things that I think we really care about. Yeah. Um, but I think we really care about them. Yeah. And I think that maybe is where that truth is, is like yeah. at the very least we might, you know, might screw up occasionally, might mm. not communicate well. And we've definitely made mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes, but mm. um, the willingness to get back up and try again yeah. because you care, I think is something that um, I feel really grateful to be a part of a group that cares like that. That's a wonderful way to end the podcast. Oh, Lawrence, this has been super enjoyable, man. I knew it would be. Yeah, well, it's just such yeah, a buzz, okay, right? You know. Oh, come on, come yeah. on. So, where can people connect with you and find you if they want to kind of connect, learn more about? Oh, yeah. You? I mean, obviously, that you know, the Forbes thirty under thirty, but it's still there. <laughs> yeah, so, it doesn't you know, have my contact details. So, yeah, exactly. I, uh, no, I, I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to make a pledge to be more active on LinkedIn, but I'm definitely uh, responsive to DMs. So, so. Yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn, Lawrence Booth Clibben. Uh, it's a long and silly name. Um, uh, so you'll you'll find it quite easily and it's quite unique. So um, yeah, L Lawrence Booth Clibben on, on LinkedIn. I am on Twitter, but I lurk on Twitter. I don't yeah. really do very much, but I am also on Twitter at L Booth Clibben. And when this podcast comes out, the social media content will include that uh, link to the YouTube video. I don't oh, generally, great. man. Yeah. It's, it, it was a it was just beautiful listening oh, to it. Thank you so, so much. So yeah. being part of it must have just been incredible. Yeah, you you brought me back to that moment. I feel um yeah, really grateful to be part of those that that group. I'm still friends with lots of those people and it um yeah, it's um something to reflect on, I think. Nice to feel uh yeah, like you've been on a journey that there's been a lot a lot of different things you've done and yeah. Wicked. <laughs>